Hello, all, and, and welcome, 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 welcome to our last virtual uh, discussion of the season, not our last one, uh, but for this season. And I am excited to introduce to you Bobby McCoy, Walter Bobby McCoy, and William Bill Yanish, uh, two amazing musical prodigies. Um, Wow, I'm gonna try to go through the list of their accomplishments. And so I'll probably get halfway through both of them because they're running off the page. I had to make the font super big so I could read it because my eyes are like just done from all the zooming and the watching the news. Um, so we'll start with uh, Bill, who is a musical director, pianist, conductor, composer, and arranger. He's been working in the Washington, D.C. area for, what is that, nine years now, almost 10, 10 years. Um, his musical direction includes Into the Woods at Fords, for which he was a Helen Hayes recipient um, for Outstanding Direction. The last five years at Signature, he was a Helen Hayes nominee. Snow Child at Arena, Ordinary Days at Roundhouse, Floyd Collins at what theater was that? First <laughs> stage. <laughs> Woo! Um, and shows for Adventure Theater. I'm a huge fan of Adventure Theater, being a mom with kids. And Michael Bobbitt used to let us come for free, which was really awesome. Uh, he's worked with, he's done uh, Man of La Mancha, the orchestrations for Man of La Mancha. So we're getting a little bit about his talent. Sorry, letting more people in. And the list goes on and on. He is working on a new uh, musical uh, with uh, Hope uh, Venueva. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that real wrong. Villanueva, um, yes. who, who who I know as a stage manager, but I know is an amazing writer. A, a playwright uh, by night, yes. A playwright by an amazing, amazing writer, um, and working on the Monster Mash with one of our favorites who left us to go live in another state, Michael Bobbitt. Uh, for Bobby, uh, his musical directions include, you know, one of my favorite shows in the whole wide world. I mean, that show really, they should bring it back. A Civil War Christmas. I'm going to have to have a talk with Alex Levy <laughs> about that one. Um, but Bobby was the musical director for uh, A Civil War Christmas, Fly By Night, which was also at first stage, for which um, he was, that we received a Helen Hayes Award for Most Outstanding Production. I think we have a few of those now. I'm not patting us on the back at all. Bat Boy, for which he received a Helen Hayes nomination for Outstanding Musical. Uh, Old Wicked Songs, for which he uh, received a Helen Hayes nomination. And I could all these Helen Hayes nominations, but Bobby, you just received a Helen Hayes Award. Am I not mistaken? Yes, and so did Bill. You want to tell us which one it was? <laughs> well, I said Bill's, because his was... Um, I just won one for Legally Blonde. Just one. For an incredible, yes. an incredible production. Incredible of production. Oh my God. God. It, 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 you guys blew my mind, really. Thank you. So we have so many more. I could go down the list, but then it'd be three o'clock and we wouldn't have learned anything about our two amazing artists. So I am going to get out of the way. I am going to spotlight them on your screen for you so you don't have to look at my funny face and you can just see them and take it away. Thanks, Dee. Yeah, I also want to let everyone know because my dog is running around in the background. I might have to like duck out of the frame for five seconds and grab her if she starts barking at the door. So just be, be forewarned. There's nothing, there's nothing going wrong. Bobby, it's great, to, it's great to talk to you. I feel like we almost never get to talk. I think we've like maybe crossed paths like three times I know it's it's always Ever. and I always like want to talk to you more, but then we always have to run to the next thing. Yeah, and there's this uh, thing. There's this thing I was just saying to uh, to Hope Villanueva uh, yesterday about music directors and stage managers, where you like you almost never see more than one of them in a room. Uh, there, there, we we so infrequently get to work with each other. Only when we're assisting, I think, really, do we get to be in the same room with each other. Um, I, I, I remember at one point I was I was sitting in a room with Gabe Mangiante and Jacob Kidder and an actor walked into the room and was like, something's not right. Like somewhere, <laughs> somewhere someone is singing acapella. <laughs> it's like if I if I see like three stage managers in a room, I always am like, so there's there's a there's a piece of scenery falling to the ground 
somewhere. That's why I love hiring all my friends to play in pits because that way we get to spend more time together. I feel yes. like that's the, the best way to do it because we're, we're never in the same rehearsal hall at the same time. Well, it's, it's also funny because when it comes time to hire assistants and to hire, you know, copyists and orchestrators and stuff, I always, I'm like, I know so-and-so, like, I, I just know all his work or her work from around town. And I, like, when I think about it, I'm like, how are they as a copyist? How are they? Like, we don't, like, occupy the same spaces. And it's such a weird thing that we're we're colleagues, but we're also just, you know, kind of ships passing the night. Also, I don't know if you're still on, when back in my Facebook days, I was on the um, theater music directors group. Uh, which I don't know if you're still in, but it had, when I left in like 2017, it had like 5,000 something members and it was people from community theater and Broadway and West End people. And, uh, and it was just so funny to me that we're such isolated artists that there are things we assume about our process that just like, that everyone does. And it's so funny to me that like any two music directors, for every two music directors, there's gonna be like three to five opinions uh, it's amazing, and and like I've never like walked into a more opinionated room than that f sort of forum. It so, is. It's wild. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Um, I wish I could write a, a show about it because it uh, it's kind of cutthroat in there. It like, is. It is. Um, yeah. But um, you know, it, the wealth of knowledge in there, you can ask pretty much anything, and you'll get ten different answers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but also you'll get a lot of like what like like for example like i will often i used to often like uh put up screenshots of, of piano scores and ask about like oh what what fingering do you use for this whatever like how do you catch all these notes and people will get so uh uh just like oh what what is wrong with you to think you even have to play all these notes? like it's so we're so in our bubble about like don't you know that this is the way things are done you would never have a trombone play that what's wrong with you like it's <laughs> it's you're right about it seeming a little cutthroat because i think and it's weird because we are also a little bit of like the, the weirdly, the, the quietest part of the design team in a lot of cases where like the director and the choreographer, I think are really like the members of the team who you, you hear, you hear their voice a lot. You hear them talk about their vision a lot in terms of like really publicly shaping the piece. And they're the people who usually get billed more often. Um, and so often our job is more uh, of a technician depending on the md that you ask um like i don't know if you'd ever heard that i i um uh, uh i remember someone was george george fulgenidi shikar was telling me about uh god rest his soul he was telling me about mm -hmm. the uh creation of the helen hayes award for music direction and how it was kind of a sharp divide in terms of him getting signatures from local mds because there are some who were like, yeah, great, we're unrecognized. This, I think it's about time for us to get an award. And actually some who were staunchly like, actually, we're not an artist. Like we are a technician. Uh, we're a person who is a traffic cop whose job is there to make sure that the show doesn't crash and burn. Um, and like, you know, and, and, and I think, and th the funny thing is some of those people are huge Helen Hayes Award winners, like like yeah. you know people who have won more frequently than anyone, who are great artists, who but who are like, no, I'm calling the show essentially, like I'm a collaborator with the stage yeah. manager. Um, well, I always I always think of you know the stage manager says go, but if my hand doesn't go up or I don't give that first prep, nothing ends up going, you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's kind of I kind of. Um, see what you're saying about um you know being more of a technician and in that sense i sort of agree um you know the choreography is something that's seen and the direction something that is also seen i um i feel like music is more something that's felt um and 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 i that i think that emotionally that changes the way um i approach things um uh, I, I really try to like see how uh, it, like I love underscoring for that reason. One of my favorite things to do in a show is underscore a scene and try to figure out how the scene um, sort of fits into the emotional trajectory of where we're going, um, which is why I love shows like Passion. Yes. And yeah. shows, you know, shows that are almost entirely sung through. Well, and it's so um, delicate. 
that like like the, when you really get down to the nitty gritty of it and like when on a technical level like i saw this a lot in into the woods where like when you need changes to that underscoring and like it's yes. just a logistical need like you're like i need some more music here you really get to see like in that original broadway production how delicate it was that this was scored in this specific way like it, particularly like that act two of into the woods where it's like all those emotional beats are so surgical like at one point at Ford's, we had to put in music after No More because there mm. is no music between No More and the next book scene. And we were like, we literally need there to be, we need there to be like 30 seconds of music. And we were like, any underscoring we add will make some kind of statement. Like what would Sondheim have wanted to, to be the, the, the mood or the statement? And like his thoughts in that, in act two specifically, are so clear that you're like, I feel like I'm, adding text to Shakespeare or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's really wild. Um, but also like, and you just experienced this with Legally Blonde. Like, it's funny because I feel like we did our, our, our Helen Hayes Awards this year for two pretty similar tasks, I think, because Legally Blonde and Into the Woods are so relentless in terms of the amount of music you hear. And uh, the fact that it's- I think uh, Legally Blonde is one of the harder shows that I've done. And, and, and uh, you know, people a lot of the time when I've talked to them about doing it, a lot of the time people approach it as fluff. But if you approach that show as fluff, you're going to get it's, you, you know, it just sort of like will derail very quickly. Um, I think uh, Bat Boy is another one that is extremely, extremely difficult to put together. Um, the so underscoring is so important. Yep. And, yep. but the way they have it broken down and where they want the lines to fit in with the music. It's just like, um, that was definitely a great challenge to have at my, uh, like when I was first getting started. Um, so I'm glad I got to like jump in with Larry O'Keefe stuff. Well, it's Larry, Larry uh, and Nell now writes the same way. Cause I, I worked on Dave with Nell at arena and she, a lot of that, it's funny. I want to know how much give and take they're like how, how much they've influenced you. Obviously they've influenced each other tremendously, but for Dave, she was writing in the same way and that uh, she was setting up Tom Kitt to write with that same kind of cut counter cut style that we've seen kind of through ragtime and going back into, into the woods, but that cinematic, like everything has to happen in a split second. The tech demands of it are so enormous. Like, like how, I mean, how much of an undertaking it is, but, but really that, that cinematic way of writing uh, is so, so difficult. And you're, you're right that Bat Boy, it's funny. So Bat Boy and Legally Blonde, I think um, are two of those pieces where you're like, you, you, if you haven't started cracking the score and diving in on it, you haven't yet had that moment of looking at it and being like, oh, this is like a real musical. This is like, <laughs> This is like not a, opera. yeah, like, yeah, well, exactly. Well, it's funny, um, my, my best friend um, uh, MD'd an academic production of Legally Blonde before they made the junior version. He, I, uh, he did it at a, for like a, a youth theater company in Annapolis like five or six years ago. And I remember I told him like, it's so good. Like, I wanna listen through it with you because wait till you see, like, you're gonna think this is a joke. Uh, you know, cause it's, you know, some movie from the 2000s. It's like a fluffy, whatever, but you're gonna, you're gonna get like three songs in and you're gonna be like, this is real. This is a real <laughs> musical. And I remember we listened through it once with score and he was like, it's fine. It's whatever. And then this, like two days later, he listened through it without the score. And it was like revelatory. Like he was like, yeah. without seeing all the minutia in front of me, without seeing all the moving pieces and just absorbing it as a whole holistically as a piece. He was like, this is brilliant. Like you get through, like you get to about the middle of what you want and you're like, oh, oh, this is, this is like, you know, the, uh, this is oversaid, but like, this is Sondheim essentially. Yeah, yeah, just, just like uh, geared towards the modern age. <laughs> Yes, yeah, a contemporary version. I remember there's a there's a temple marking at one point in the middle of what you want uh, that just totally like beggars the imagination that it's like um, the it's it's during the reggae section because she's got like a Ben Folds thing going on and oh, he's doing Folds? it's like Ben Folds meets reggae meets musical. It's like it's an insane temple marking. Um, and Larry O'Keefe has another. I don't know how well you know Heather's, but he also has. Heather's. <laughs> yeah, he, he has, um, he has, it's like intense, 
horrifying Gandalf falling to his death type music I is know. one of the tempo where it's so good. <laughs> I some of my yeah some definitely some of my favorite grooves to play some of my favorite just like um just the way that the music fits in with the story I it's not um you know I I guess it's like different than like doing a rock musical or like a sung through show um I I just prefer big um, shows that um, sort of have that sort of style of writing. Well, and you have done a lot of shows in the past few years that have like a big epic scope. And like, I, it's funny because I keep looking at your credits over the last few years and saying like, I'm too tired to do, like, I can't, like, I, like you, you did like the wild party. And like, it's, I feel like I've got, I've only got like the juice for a musical that's that size, like every, you know, two or three years or whatever. Like I'll assist, I'll assist on Anything Goes, um, um, but doing something like Woods was like, even just physically like took me to capacity. And actually this kind of, this ties in with um, one of the questions that we had in preparation for this. And I'm actually really interested to hear what your response for this is because your kind of, you know, your resume is so different from mine. Um, but one of the questions was, uh, what was a particularly complicated or challenging show for you? And how did you overcome the challenge? Um, because mine are two such different productions. Because um, my two answers would be Into the Woods for all the answers we've been talking about, the reasons we've been talking about. And because like Legally Blonde, the music is so relentless. Like, I don't know if you guys, I, I didn't clock how many kind of breaks you guys got to even take a sip of water during that show but it's similar to woods yeah. i think like yeah. ours our longest break was 45 seconds um and it was probably similar for you um and the amount of like looney tunes music because all of act one has very specific like he throws a thing and the music goes boring and like that all of that is just like relentless through the entire show but the other thing is and is is blonde supposed to be stick or is it supposed to be piano md well, it's 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 a keyboard three and conductor book, so we're literally uh, playing some bassoon lines and some scales. But other than that, it's nothing too difficult. Most of the time, thankfully, my hands are able to be in the air for that show. That's um, awesome. That's because cool, yeah, because that keys three book is probably pretty sparse. It is pretty sparse. It just like really establishing grooves, and then like four bars in, keys two takes over and stuff. That's great. Because so, I was gonna say it would be really really hard to play keys one on that book. Cause it's, it's supposed to be, I don't know what you guys ended up using, but it's a big, it's a big old, the kind of orchestration they don't really even, you know, a decade later, they don't really do that much now. Um, yeah, we had, we, we had 11 at Keegan. Which yeah. Which is like pretty big for a Keegan for, for to be up in that loft. I was but. gonna say, how'd you guys fit up there? Cause we, we had, we did the small orchestration for Parade when I um, played under Jake. And that mm -hmm. even at what, like six or seven players, we were like, ooh, this is, I would getting a full band up there. That had to be a, a project. Yeah, we were all like, uh, you know, um, I was here. I had keyboard two in front of me, and then keyboard three to the left of me, and then we were the the winds. I had two wind players, and they were with their like seven or eight instruments to the left of me, and you know the the guitar section. He has like six guitars. Of course. Mandolin, banjo, um, uh, the big drum set, and then the, the really the trick was putting the brass around the corner. Yeah. Like yeah. You know that there's like a staircase going up to the loft. Mm -hmm. They were like tucked away. Yeah. But it also helped sort of dampen that brass sound coming sure. from up there. That show is a screamer. It's it's so loud. It is such a loud show. Well, the other thing is that I had forgotten is that in contemporary shows that the guitars and the percussion take up the space of the entire rest of the orchestra. Like I, I believe on, on Spring Awakening, like <laughs> the amount, cause of the, 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 the different instruments plus the different tunings, I, yeah. and there are two guitarists. And I remember the guitars being like half of the pit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, sorry, um, uh, D, D um, asked me to, so to oh. explain what um, keyboard three was. So in orchestrations, a lot of the times um, there's, the keyboard parts are split up in between different players. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most of the time shows tend to have one and two keyboards, um, but a lot of the newer musicals that uh, are, are big and sort of um, just a 
tricky to conduct or end up having three and the conductor predominantly is on the third one and it's usually a more it's a sparser book what i find uh i know elf has a keyboard three book too um yeah, yeah it's so. it's weird because it's it's funny to think of it from a logistical perspective because obviously all these choices come from those original tours and those original broadway productions and it's funny to me that they decided rather than have it be stick to have the conductor still play at, at, at in a few more notes because that that means they still don't save the money like they still you know they're giving well, that, think, that conductor still gets a double yeah yeah well i'd rather be playing <laughs> well it's funny because i now i'm at the point where like i would so much rather do stick um uh, and like like both are great but i remember like how what a relief it was when i first started um i've, I've assisted for john cobb Fleisch at sig a bunch of times and like the first time I assisted for him when I knew I was going on uh, for West Side Story, I remember confessing to him being like, oh, you know, I actually really like, I like stick better. And he was like, well, it's easier. But, like that's, it's, <laughs> that's not like, and I was like, is it? That makes me feel so much better. Like, I don't know. I felt so weird about like, cause, no. cause yeah, I, I mean. I would say I prefer it, but um, I, I guess with the, a lot of the smaller non-equity houses, it's a, it's just a little harder to, it's it's just harder. I rather you know I have more control and, and yes. I, I feel like um and you can fill in. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the other thing is um uh when you're at the smaller houses and you you run into more of the issue of like that kind of revolving door of players, which is obviously not you know not a thing at the bigger houses, but like when you've got someone who like maybe this is their first show, maybe this is their second show, and it's the middle of your week you want to be able to be in a position where if they choke, you can, you know, you can just play the notes so that there's not a big gaping silence in the middle of the number. Yeah. And I'm, I even, I think even if I were worse at conducting, I'd want to have like a keyboard that I could like probably sit down at some point. And if anything were to happen, I could like take over. Um, that is the one thing about stick that is so nerve wracking is that like you can't save them if show apocalypse happens like <laughs> you i mean if you have a really good amd they'll they'll you know fudge their way through it and they'll figure it out but now you it's it's you you have to somehow be the person leading the music but also the person making no sound and that is like it's one of those things where like you have to put it out of your mind or else you'll go crazy <laughs> But um, sure. um, but the the other my other answer for this was actually Floyd Collins because in a very different way because I was conducting from the keys on Floyd Collins, and uh, uh, it is one of the hardest scores like in the entire repertoire I think like I think it's up there with the lot like the La Cusa scores where it's like really 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 hard, um, and uh, I was triggering tracks because for those who don't know, Floyd Collins makes extensive use of echoes um, that run in counterpoint with the singer on stage. Often the band will be changing time signatures while interlocking with like four different echo tracks that have to get triggered from the conductor. Um, and so I'm doing that on top of playing, which you're not supposed to, like you, you are supposed to conduct stick on Floyd Collins. And, uh, yeah, that was that was the other. But the thing is, like for both that and Woods, which are my two answers for what's the especially complicated show, I kind of for as much work as they were, I couldn't have imagined my season without them. Like, I'm sure you've experienced this thing as well, where it's like you have a show where you're like, I really killed myself for that one, but like, I can't imagine this past season not having done it. Um, yeah, and like I can't imagine my time in DC without having done either of those, which is another reason why I'm glad to be here, you know, at first stage talking about it because like, it was one of those rare things. Like I remember getting done with that show and being like, what else from my bucket list of like weird shows that no one programs can I do next? Yeah, I always I always tell Alex that uh, first stage is sort of like the place I can, I, I can get all the shows that no one else will do, but you know, I know will work really well in their space. Yeah, like Bat Boy, I think is a good example of like, that's a show I would love to do and like no one's really doing it. Um, I want, yeah, I want to do like, I want to do like Grey Gardens somewhere because it's like no one's programming that's, it. That's one I want to do. Alex, yeah. you're here? Yeah, all right. 
<laughs> so okay so bobby what is your i'm interested to know what is your like your crazy show and how did you how did you make it work okay so um i, th I have two um i think wild party um if you people know that show it's a sort of a sung through piece um of all sorts of different styles but predominantly jazz um by andrew lippa um the, I think the, the trickiest part about working on that production, particular production at Constellation was I had a, a band of six and that orchestration is calls for 12 people. So not only the yeah. reduction yeah. of the winds and figuring out how to fit seven people in a space that was, I think, designed for five. <laughs> we were, I mean, we were literally on top of each other to the point where the only way I could get out was having to shift my keyboard every time I wanted to just go out. Um, That's at but, Source, right? Yeah. It's at yeah, source. source is a tricky, that is a tricky space. I mean, it looked beautiful. It looked yeah. beautiful, and, you know, um, but just the, the sheer amount of music and um, it just fluctuates from styles that are very different from each other. And so you always have to be on your toes um, that was one of my first shows I implemented using a click track and sort of like having some in-ear monitoring just because of the way we were positioned. Yeah. Um, which was really helpful. And um, I, I learned a lot and I, I learned that um, consistency is really important, especially for a show like that. Yep. Um, I, I've, you know, it's, it's tricky um, keeping a show consistent because we're all humans in, in, in nature. Um, so and we I want to perform. Do, yeah. Um, but I, at a certain point, like um, the, the dancers need consistency and um, that's one of the trickiest things. And then um, I, the second show would be um, when I worked on In the Heights and um, just having to do the translation for Gala with Salgado Productions. Um, I learned a lot. I learned that... <laughs> When you're translating to a different language, um, not everything works. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and so um, it was really great being able to use that side of like my culture and get to know people that grew up speaking my same tongue, I guess. Yeah. That do theater, which I don't really find around here. Um, but I think the challenging thing was is like um, we had four weeks of rehearsals in New York, and then the longest tech process I've ever been in was that show. It was two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely worked really hard those six weeks. That is a hard show. That is a really insane show. <laughs> it's funny. I, you know, I, I grew up listening to salsa and, and Latin music um, at home, but I never really like put two and two together of how much I loved it and like I identified with that part of my culture until yeah. I started working on that show um now I now salsa is like on my playlist all the time yes well it's <laughs> funny I'm because stuff from the 70s and the 60s that's you know, the, like... awesome <laughs> yeah well it's funny because like I I feel like a lot of musicians in town and I talked to a few I think I talked to a few of the players uh after your production who were like my hot take is that in the heights is the better score like from that in yeah. Hamilton and like I think part of it is I mean it's so apples and oranges but like I think part of it is that that genre that idiom has such a warmth and such a and it's not part of my culture at all, but it's there's such a nostalgia about it. Like, I don't know, it just seems familiar and warm and like you understand the setting of the play immediately when you hear those charts and you hear those rhythms and it's it's so its own thing. You know, it, it was the first show where like, um, it was like, you know, I feel like a lot of shows um, back in like, the golden age had like some sort of Latin number, like the mambo or the cha cha cha. Yep. It's the first show that um, I heard off my culture portrayed like authentically, um, and um, I really identified with all the different styles. Like, who knew you could put a bachata in a musical? 
Uh huh. You know what I mean? Or a reggaeton, yeah. and it would do well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it would contribute to the story. My mind was blown my first time I heard that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it's it's really something truly new, and it still feels truly new. Like I remember my experience. My first experience of the show was watching them do ninety six thousand at the Tonys that year, and being like, oh, and like seeing the counterpoint fall into place and everything, and being like, oh, this is like this is contemporary American opera, like not, you know, no offense to what is happening in the classical world of like, you know, real opera, but I was like, this is like taking real American music and putting, you know, theatricality and drama and counterpoint on top of it. And I was like, I cannot believe, cause I was so jaded. This was, this was like my, when it, when it came out, that was probably like my sophomore year of college and I was super jaded and I was like, you know, Broadway is so sanitized and it's such BS and it's like it was right after that year that like Jersey Boys won the best musical because like there was really nothing happening and like I remember seeing that performance and being like oh my god there's like new there are there's a possibility for new things and interesting things to still happen yeah yeah I just you know I hope it's not like a I, I, I hope it's not like a just a fad though I hope you know, I, I really hope that um, we can explore different cultures authentically through through different types of storytelling because I think it's really important. Um, there's so many stories that that need to be told that are of our own, you know, experience, and and it really opened my eyes as to what's possible. And to tell it not in an appropriative way, like that's the other problem is that, and I think we're reckoning with this now that like we're in a pandemic and everything has shut down that we're seeing the We See You uh, white American theater movement. Uh, my worry about it has always been like, if you want to do something truly new in order for it to get through the Broadway machine for any of us to get it, like it has to go through these layers of appropriation and sanitization and boringness and, you know, hegemony. Um, so hopefully this current moment is exploring that a little more meaningfully, you know? Yeah. Yep. And I mean, I, the fact that like now we have stuff like Hamilton um, that's accessible for people to see, um, I think will sort of open people's eyes that musicals aren't what we're used to. It's not just, you know, Annie or the golden age stuff. Um, there's a lot more that's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I know people, you know, who are, uh, uh, you know, from where I'm from, who are like super terrified of hip hop and like, like it's just got cultural trappings and associations for them that they're like, I can't, I'm, I'm my whiteness, I can't. And like, uh, who like are obsessed with Hamilton now and like for better and for worse, you know, like the Overton window has moved. So like, uh, I think there are good things and bad things about it, but it is on some level introducing people to a culture outside their own and saying like, this is legitimate. This is a, this is real. Like there are people for whom this is, you know, it, it's, it's not, like you say, it's not all about Rodgers and Hammerstein. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, there was a question. Um, so uh, I'm going to just explain a, a click track is um, something that we use. To, um, it's a, basically a metronome in the musician's ears or the music director's ear that just sort of guides us and um, keeps things consistent um, from show to show. I don't necessarily use it all the time, but um, there's definitely like big dance numbers or things that are sequenced with lights and have to be um, timed with MIDI. Sometimes you have to connect MIDI to the, to the light board. Um, MIDI is a uh, musical instrument digital interface that nice. we use <laughs> uh, that we use um, to run various different programs so yeah uh, I, I feel like usually in my experience it's only used when there's like an electronic element or like we're we're, we're playing in a genre that is you know a, you know a kind of a club track or whatever the, the the most terrifying one I've ever done outside of Floyd Collins which I had to like hit a button on a downbeat and ha have a click in my ear so that the musicians keep playing with the fake echo of Evan Casey sounding around the auditorium is um, when, I, uh, when I assisted on Dave, there's a, there's a trick they do in the opening number where 
the guy, for those of you who don't know, there's a, a guy playing a double of the president. And so that actor has to play both the president and the kind of Prince and the Pauper lookalike. And so he's at, the guy playing it is at the front of the stage singing and the guy, the president is on like a video screen, like way back and they counterpoint with each other. And the, the, the video of both of them, they harmonize with each other at the end of the number into the button. And so literally like, and also a confetti cannon shoots at the, on the button of the number. So all of it is tracked to this click. And, and it's imperative that the musicians stay on the click track because if the, if the video, cause it, and the way you did it is you go one, you're playing your one, two, three, four, but, and you hit the button on the downbeat. But if you don't hit it at that right moment, then the fake person who's harmonizing with the real person, it's, it's triggering both the audio and the video. And if those don't sync up, the whole number is ruined and the confetti cannon is ruined. And I never had to go on. <laughs> Thank God, I never had to go on. But I did have to do it like four times in tech from the piano. And even yeah. just doing it from the piano, just be from, from the hot seat, having to hit the thing and listening to the video go and the confetti cannons go, I was like, ah, this is the most pressure I've ever experienced in my professional life. <laughs> yep, uh, I, I can definitely, uh, we have in in the heights the one of the programming things was like the um the keyboard would go um but that that little thing was for some reason like programmed into the into one key as, as a trigger um so if we didn't start that click at the right time it was just like yeah just say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Does In the Heights have a lot of clicks built in? Because I assume, like, probably Hamilton, I assume, like, half the show is on click. But In the Heights, I don't know. Oh, yeah, a lot of it is, um, especially the stuff like 96,000 mm -hmm. and um, the opening numbers click. Um, and we, I know we use click to run the uh, some of the lights with, for the fireworks um, during, during the blackout scene. Yeah, it's it's funny. One of the things I've discovered only in the last like two ish years is like how much the metronome is your friend. It's something that I like really was in denial about from my first like five or six years in the professional world being like my ear is good enough. Like I, you know, I take it as a personal affront if you tell me that this tempo was wrong because it's in my body. I have been playing, I have shaped this score and like, and it, it's, that's such BS. And it's like everyone, even us, even conductors, like our bodies react to the fact that we're in a run. We're tired, and, it's seven yes. shows a week. And, you know, um, so yeah, I think it keeps me honest. Um, but more than that, it just like makes sure, um, we have a consistent show and it runs the same, you know, I try to sort of keep it um, around the same. It's amazing how much um, a few clicks makes a difference to like the pace of a show. It's, I mean, and especially I, big, the big dance number. I mean, like my, my big thing was for anything goes is I was like, if I conduct this five clicks faster, people are going to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's I, I, not until I started doing like big dance shows did I really start going in in rehearsal and being like, I have to plan what my what my metronome is going to be. Like I have to plan what, and, and when we make adjustments, I have to note it. Like it's it's weird how long it took me to really internalize that that was important. I, mean, I still, I mean, yeah, I, I had to learn quickly, especially with um, some, some of the people I was working with um, for In the Heights and you know, they had a lot of like expectations of the way things had, were done that I had just had to sort of learn really quickly. Um, but I feel like I, it was good for me in the long run. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, that's the thing is, um, and it actually, it relates to one of the questions we were asked, which was um, in what way has being an MD stretched you and challenged you? And my, my major thing is uh, as a collaborator, like, I feel like I got into the field having this like very, cause I'm a classical kid. Like I come from the classical world originally academically. And I came in having this really kind of chip on my shoulder about like, well, the conductor has a vision and like, you just don't get it, man. And like how much the actual industry is about, it, you know, it is 
as much about collaborating with the director and the choreographer as it is about the way you think the score should sound. Like I remember I would so frequently like in, in, in my youth, I would like listen to a production and be like, oh, Paul Gemignani is taking this tempo terror. Like why, why did he make this ludicrous decision? This is far too fast. And I would blame the conductor in my head because in my head I was like, the conductor has made the decision about what the tempo is. And like, I like the big way that theater has challenged me has been being like, mm, it's not just about what you think will sound the best. Like it is about what the director needs, what the choreographer needs, what is safe, what is possible with the tech, um, you know, and what the actors need. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, I had to learn how to say yes a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like, um, I don't know. I, it, it was like a, just sort of a, I didn't really ever have like too many like mentors in terms of like um, music direction. Um, so I've had to learn a lot on my own, but I think that's definitely the biggest thing I've had to learn is how to just say yes and then figure it out. Um, it just, it, I think I, when I was, when I first started, I was, I said no a lot. <laughs> Same. Um, just yeah. because I I had a, a certain feeling of how things should go. So yeah, I um I definitely came in guns blazing uh, with this idea. Like when a director said like, "Can we change it to make it like this?" and it disagreed with the score, I my mindset immediately went to like, "Oh, you're not talented enough of a director to make what's in the score work." Like I have to be mad at you because. Like you're the one who is the the squeaky wheel. You're not making it work. And that's such a poisonous, that's such a bad mindset to have about your collaborators. Like we're all trying to make this text work. You know, we're all trying to make, and, and I think the thing you're saying about um, learning how to say yes, a lot of the time, the, the question that's being asked of you is, is this possible? Tell me what's possible. And like figuring out li literally like what is possible? Like what will be, you know, what, what will be a thing that works on stage rather than like, I came in, I annotated this score. I made, like, I made the decision, like, I know what works and I understand, you know, Jason Robert Brown in a way that you don't. And it's not, that, that's not what it's about. They, the question is, is it possible? And yeah, and when I was younger, I used to go into my first rehearsal with my score all marked up with ideas of how I thought, as opposed to like, I do the work, but beforehand, but I can't really go in with like any preconceived notions because I feel like a lot of the time, shit, everything just gets shifted. You know what I mean? Um, and when you have twenty-five creative minds in one room, yep. And the yeah. actors are always going to surprise you. That's the other thing yeah. is that like they're going to have something particular about. It's funny because now I on shows on some shows I veer into like the opposite problem where I'm so like I just want to know what this or that actor is going to do in this moment. I don't even want to make a decision. Like I just want to see what they bring, um, yeah. and that's something. That's a line you have to walk. Like that's something that's a new kind of challenge for me is to kind of walk that back and be like, no, I have to make some decisions because yeah. you know this has to have some kind of vision. But it also, I think, depends on from show to show. Like there are shows, like if you're doing, you know, if you're doing a Sweeney Todd, if you're doing a, an Into the Woods, you know that a lot of that is going to be on your shoulders. Whereas if you're doing a Guys and Dolls, if you're doing an Anything Goes or whatever, it's more about like, you kind of wait for the director and choreographer to refer to you to be like, is this possible? Tell me what's possible. Because if this is too fast and they're going to kill themselves, don't like, like it's, it's much, much more about logistics than it is about art. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the technician aspect. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's the thing that continues to be tough for me um, because I definitely gravitate towards shows where you have to be the artist and I, I get, I have to find ways of coping with shows where I have to be the technician because you always have to be both, I think. I think that's yeah. actually kind of the answer to that question that George Fulgeniti Shakar posed all those years to us when they were inventing the, the Helen Hayes Award for Music Direction is, is it, is it an artist or a technician? And I think really the answer is both, but it oscillates so wildly from show to show. Yeah. Like you, you go in, like I, you know, when I assisted on Anything Goes, I remember um, Paul Sportelli, he said, had such a healthy mindset, like, like going in being like, this isn't about me. The show is not about me. Like you don't program Anything Goes and say to the music director, like, 
this is your time to shine, buddy. Like, this is the time when like, we're going to know <laughs> what your decision is about buddy beware. Like we're, we're going to, we're going to really get, you know, your take, <laughs> your take on friendship. Like it's not, it, that's, that's not what it's about. And I, that's the thing is like, I have to really, uh, uh, you know, navigate that. I, I, I love navigating it though. It, it just makes me, you know, I, every time I learn something new from every show I do. Um, and that's just because, um, you know, every director has a different approach. Some directors are very, very hands-on, whereas like working every beat, um, other directors are, you know, m much more like about the, the bigger picture. Um, it just, it just really depends on people's style. But I love adapting. That's my favorite thing is being able to adapt to my other to my collaborator's style, and then just bringing my own thing to the table. Well, and also the surprising thing that results from that is always, I mean, that's that's why like some directors who uh, I've 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 it's interesting to me to work with kind of non musical theater directors because their ideas are so weird that like often. <laughs> When they ask me like, what would it be like if it were like this? I'll be like, that's horrible. That's terrible. And I'll try it and I'll be like, oh no, that's pretty interesting. Like that's, you know, like often it will yeah. be horrible but sometimes it'll be something really, and the, 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 interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing that results from that though is really like, that's a big part of the job. Like that's what's really cool. Do you find, do you like to do a lot of pre-production discussion with the director? Um, it just depends on what their style is. Um, you know, I, I've I've had as much as like a week of pre-production work with a director with just a few dancers in a room. Wow. To figure stuff out. Yeah. To the to the point, or sometimes we just have a few meetings beforehand. But, um, you know, it, for Fame, when we did Fame, we I was in New York uh, the first week of December of 2018, just like figuring out ideas and how we wanted to change it up but yeah yeah i find with some directors they're really really open to it and with others they're such an enigma like they really like i will bother them i will like you know really yeah. email them all the time and be like what do you think about this what do you think about this and like a lot of the time frankly i think they they're waiting for the actors like they're waiting for like they've got broad ideas but they're waiting to be surprised by what the actor is bringing into the room it's always a fine line but i really try um you know I, I if i have like an acting suggestion for for an actor i really try to give it to the director because sometimes it i've had people bite my <laughs> you know yes yes bite my head off well that's another question i have for you is because this varies so much from md to md because i know some who don't do it at all and some who really 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 do it do you do any of the like i'm going to kind of coach your acting a little bit in this song no, I will. I, 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 a little bit, a little bit. Um, but I usually really like having the director in the room with me while yep. I'm working music. Same. Yeah. Because yeah. I, when I was first getting started, I would say stuff, and then I'd they come back and it'd be like, no, 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 and then I'd be, I'd get, I'd get the talking to. Well, so. well, yeah, and and the thing is, what I've found is that most directors I work with. If I, if I supersede them and I, I tell them like, oh, that you should do this on this moment or whatever acting wise, what the director comes up with is gonna be so much more nuanced and so much you know of a deeper read than what I had for this moment because I, I'm letting so much of the music do the work for me. Um, and I think the director, they're, obviously their background is so much more text-based that they're just, you know, they're, they're gonna go in with a, with a deeper, closer read of the text than I will. Yeah, and I really try to have my voice be held, uh, heard in the rehearsal room. The the work that I do, like during music work, I really try to make it focused on on the music and and like because a lot of the time, like for a new brain, I know I don't even think we got through it all. But uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, wait, how far did you how far did you get on new brain? Did you you got into no, rehearsals we, or we, we, no? We we started rehearsals. We were a week away from tech. Ah, um, uh. but. It, it, again, it's just the sheer amount of music, um, and the it's very intricate. So, of course, yeah, it's wild. 
gentlemen. Hi. Hi. This is really great listening to you all um, talk and share with each other. We do have a few questions. Um, I actually, Gail Howell has one. And uh, she wants to know which theaters in D.C. present acoustic challenges, i.e. dead spaces, um, echoes, or things that just don't work well for you as composers, sound designers. And what do you do about it? How do you fix it? Oh, you got any? Because I got a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, love, I love my folks at Gala, but... Um, you know, unfortunately, they have this beautiful space with this beautiful dome that is not conducive to sound. Um, they have a space that's sort of rectangle, but above them, it's it's in the mezzanine, so it's a big dome with this beautiful artwork. But all the sound goes up there and gets stuck up there. Um, and uh, it was just, they basically had to bring in a new sound system, you know, a week in the tech because we could not get the sound to work in that space. Um, definitely one of the bigger challenges I've worked with in DC. Um, and the, the orchestra was in a loft behind the actors, probably like 15 feet in the Always. air. Yep. So, you know, we then had to build sort of like a studio up there with like, um, you know, and put shields and like, plexiglass to sort of put the drums and isolate them because the sound of the the band was like roaring so yes. definitely a lot to learn in a week and um <laughs> very scary times uh there's have you have you worked at uh, have you ever played at roundhouse no because they i i don't know after the after the reno maybe maybe they fixed this a little bit but that it's hard sound designing in there is hard i i always feel so deeply for the sound designers in this town because we have a town full of weird spaces and we're doing contemporary shows that are mostly designed to not be played acoustically. Like they're, they're you know, shows like Legally Blonde where it's like, it's a loud, loud show. And it's like, how, you, how do you contain it? How do you sound design it? Um, SIG is always a challenge because it's such a small space. The the Max, they're, they're, they have a really like, especially because they do shows sometimes with like 17, 20 orchestra members. And it's like, how do you sound design for that? Um, uh, Ford's is good. I have had a good experience at Ford's. I think they've got a really good, because it's an old fashioned, you know, like a real orchestra pit. Um, the weirdest one I ever did was um, on Carousel at Arena. Um, the way it was conceptualized was uh, it was in the fish handler and the rhythm section was underground. And so you completely can control the sound. Like all of it is curated. And then everyone but the rhythm section was on a platform above the audience. So I'm talking like, three string players, three wind players, three brass players. And they were acoustic. There was no plexiglass. Like they were out going out into the audience. And so the notes we would get all through tech and previews were like softer, softer, softer. Yeah. Like it got to a point where like uh, Sportelli kept telling us to mark one more P in a bunch of sections of underscoring to the point where people were like, Paul, I can't phonate. I've got like eight P's over this note. <laughs> Yeah, I think a source is another one. You know, the the shows at Constellation are there's it, the space is so tiny already. Um, for like a little shop, I wasn't even facing the drummer, but the drummer was like to the left above me, and we had the second keyboard behind me. It was just to be able to fit people back there, and then. Um, the only way I find it will really works so well in that space is if we're on ear in ear monitors. Yeah. Otherwise, we're all blasting amps and stuff. So, just a lot of fun challenges. Well, we have a question from Eileen Mandel. Eileen, I think it might be too long to answer this, but <laughs> tell me if you've had any near catastrophes and how you have <laughs> avoided them. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I've had some things that weren't music related. Like I, uh, I had a person in Into the Woods uh, have a stroke during a show. And so we had to stop um, and, you know, have them, you know, get an ambulance. And we, we intermissed for 20 minutes um, and then have, had his understudy come on and started. It's, all, it's always been illness. It's always been things like that. Like we had an actor in the last five years at SIG 
get sick and lose his voice in the middle of the show, um, put in, you know, a 20 minute break and had his understudy get in the car because the understudy wasn't in the building. And so, you know, essentially the stage manager got on God mic and said, you know, come get, you know, or they, they, they got on God mic and said, there's now going to be an intermission and got on the phone and called the understudy. Um, disaster i i i once caused a show at signature theater to be delayed for an hour because i didn't have an assistant and uh i got stuck in the rolling thunder uh um uh, marathon at uh in, in the middle of town got stuck on pennsylvania avenue and i essentially for a two o'clock show i made it to sig at 250 and they basically like had open bar for the audience in the meantime uh but yeah and like i asked the stage manager do they know that it's me and she said, no, I just told them someone essential isn't here. But I do know it's the only time in my life I've ever gotten entrance applause. <laughs> um, OK, so one that's like not musical is, uh, well, it was during tech for, it was the night before Invited Dress for a production of MAME I was doing. And um, our MAME was walking backstage and um, I don't think the backstage had been cleared and she put her foot on a dolly and she shattered her like whole oh, arm. Oh. And, and then the next, um, you know, then we had, uh, she got surgery like the next morning and then we had to like fly in an actress from New York to do the role literally in like 24 hours. Um, definitely some, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Times. crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I know we're a one minute over time, but Sydney uh, Crutcher has a, a really good question. And this is our last um, virtual dis uh, roundtable discussion of, of, of the season. So I kind of want to let Sydney ask her question. If you need to leave, um, wave goodbye and thank you so much. But we'd love for you to stay to, to hear uh, the response to Sydney's question. Sydney? Hi, um, I wanted to know about when you're working with new works that haven't been interpreted yet, like how, how do you approach those differently? Because you can't necessarily go hear what past conductors and, and orchestras did. I don't know about you, Bobby. It's my favorite thing. I love it so much. It is such a great, because I'm also a composer. And so um, actually the thing you mentioned earlier, Bobby, about like when I get surprised by something someone else says in the room and I have to adapt and the thing that results from that, that is actually like, the, the new works are like that on steroids. It's like literally, I'm not even hearing a song that I have a cast album of and I have one vision of it that's in my head and I have literally no idea how it's going to hit actors, how it's going to hit the director, how it's going to hit audiences. And um, I have one, one thing at, when I was at Kennedy Center doing the premiere of Me Jane a few years ago, uh, we had a scene where literally we spent like days going like, move this thing, move this thing, move this thing. It's got to make you cry. It's all, all it is is like, we've got to figure out the alchemy for how th this text and this right here, this needs to move. How do we do it in order to make someone cry? And like working on it for days and not letting up and being like, this didn't, this didn't cry, cry trigger me yet. And like you getting there on like the fourth or fifth day, watching it come together and having everyone in the room just start bawling was one of the most, like that element of new works is like, ah, it's my, it's literally my favorite thing in theater. It scares me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, uh, I love interpreting people's work and, um, uh, but I, I don't really see myself as necessarily a composer. Um, I, I don't know. I just have a hard time connecting with that sort of part of my brain. Um, I really love writing arrangements, which I guess is in a way composing and <laughs> orchestrating, but, um, you know, definitely, I don't think I could undertake a whole show like you do. <laughs> well, it's the thank best. <laughs> thank you so much, gentlemen. This has been great. Um, you are both so delightful and engaging and so nice to uh, close out our virtual roundtable discussions with with two prodigies, to be honest, and in, um, <laughs> in, 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 in their field. Um, 
hands down and, and easy for me to say. And I'm just going to ask Alex if you would like to speak to our audience and our artists, this being the last one. You know, usually I don't let you talk because you never stop. <laughs> but the first time I, that I, he has unmuted me in six weeks, y'all. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Bill, Bobby, I want to say thank you so much. It does my heart so good just to see you too, but especially to hear you all talk about your art. It's so, it's so wonderful. As, as a lot of you know, we were, we were in it with Bobby, uh, oh God, eight months ago. Um, and the, I, I, I feel like I'm the only person who got to see New Brain as I, you know, a, a day or two before we shut down, I saw uh, their first run through of the We're show. We're having the same thing with Guys and Dolls as well. Like it's, it's cr we had one preview. And you all missed some, just a, a brilliant show. We still, I still hope someday to figure out a way to, to get it back. But most of all, I want to thank all of y'all who, who have found a way to keep in community with us during this, during this time, come into our virtual rooms this week or in the spring or over the last six weeks. We are sort of pausing our virtual roundtables as, as we did you know, with our first round of community conversations. We're recreating, we're coming up with some great new programming that's going to get announced soon. Um, but in the meantime, happy Thanksgiving. If I don't see you before the holidays, happy holidays. We miss you so much. Um, and we, uh, we just can't wait to be with you all again. So thank you all.